I feel bad that you came home so worried about me, but could you sign the divorce papers right here and now? I had just returned home after a long month in the hospital following a complex transplant surgery to save my beloved daughter. The surgery left me with anemia and extreme weakness that made it difficult to even stand. My once beloved husband was now cold to me and pressed the divorce papers on me. My name is Lisa, I just turned 30 last month and have been passionately devoted to my work since my 20s. I was a career woman and had worked hard from the beginning of my career, earning promotions to the point where I was now responsible for training several new employees. I've always had a strong sense of justice, treating everyone fairly, and speaking out against wrongdoing. While my colleagues of the same age got married and left their jobs, I put my career first. This led to jealousy and envy from others. If you keep focusing only on work, you'll miss your chance to get married. Are you planning to get married when you're tired of working, to be supported by someone else? Despite my inner strength, I was deeply hurt when faced with such malicious remarks. Working under difficult conditions, I realized that I was already 28 years old. In that special year, I was transferred to a newly established department which further ignited my passion for work. This new department, created to drive innovative projects, was actively recruiting high-performing employees. My accomplishments could no longer be ignored by those who had once looked down on me, filling me with deep confidence. It was during this period of confidence that a significant event changed the course of my life, meeting Max. Max is five years older than me and was originally part of our sales team. His suit-clad figure naturally attracted attention, and his gentle expression was very charming. His neat clothes, cleanliness, and refreshing smile made him popular with both female and male colleagues and supervisors. While I secretly admired him, I prioritized my job over romance at that time, treating him strictly as a professional partner. The job was much busier than expected, and I found myself more exhausted than ever. Struggling with client relations, I felt increasingly unstable as I repeatedly apologized to various people. Normally impervious to the sarcasm of my boss, I found myself overly sensitive and crying alone in a bathroom stall. Max, who had a heavy workload of his own, was the first to notice my state and supported me even staying late to help, which deepened my trust and admiration for him. Though I used to believe in completing tasks alone, working with Max taught me the value of cooperation. As work slowed down, we started going out for drinks together, gradually closing the distance between us. As we grew closer, I learned more about Max's personal life, he was divorced due to his ex-wife's infidelity and was raising his daughter on his own. Feeling guilty for keeping him late at work and leaving his elementary school-age daughter alone, I apologized to him. Actually, my daughter is turning 10, but she's independent enough to make dinner by herself and wake up by herself to go to school in the morning. Although I feel guilty for making her feel lonely, she's like a little wife supporting our home, which is really comforting. When I saw Max's slightly sad smile as he said this, I saw his vulnerability for the first time, and that difference aroused in me a strong protective instinct. From that moment, I began to see Max not just as a colleague, but as a man. To avoid causing Max any more trouble, I began to work more diligently, making sure to avoid unnecessary overtime. Whenever Max faced difficulties at work, I offered my support so that he could return home as early as possible to spend precious time with his beloved daughter. Deep down, I longed to share good times with him again, just like the old days when we had good job parties together. However, considering his responsibilities as a father to an elementary school child, I tried to suppress my selfish desires. Gradually, our relationship changed and Max began to open up and share his vulnerabilities only with me. This is the first time in my life that I felt so supported, both emotionally and physically. 
Thanks to you, I've been able to spend more time with my daughter, and I'm truly grateful to you, Lisa. He expressed his gratitude one day after work had settled down, during a moment at the bar. Caught up in the moment, I inadvertently confessed my feelings to him, though he deftly declined at the time. Unable to suppress the emotions that had blossomed in my heart, I continued to pursue him fervently. About a month after my confession, Max finally opened his heart and we began dating. A year into our relationship, we decided to get married, despite repeated objections from my parents. Regardless of the partner, I'm worried just thinking about you entering your first marriage, especially with a partner who has an elementary school-aged child. Can you really handle it, especially as the child approaches adolescence? My mother said this, and my father looked at me with a complex expression, filled with mixed emotions. My parents were very concerned about me marrying him, who had a child with his ex-wife. My parents had an arranged marriage when they were very young, so it was difficult for them to imagine my marriage. However, driven by my deep love for Max, I worked persistently to gain my parents' approval, promising that no matter what, I would never be a burden to them. As a result, Max and I were able to get married without any problems. We announced our marriage at work, but I decided not to change my last name at work because my longtime business associates knew me by my last name. The transition to married life has required gradual preparations in between daily tasks to ensure a smooth adjustment to our new routine. Since our marriage, I've made an effort to visit Max on the weekends and try to bond with his daughter, Katie, by doing activities she might enjoy and preparing meals that would appeal to her. Despite my attempts to enjoy our time together based on what I'd learned from Max about Katie's hobbies and favorite foods, her clear answers were not easy to come by. While polite, Katie was fundamentally reserved often retreating to her private space immediately after our activities ended. Katie is shy and reserved, so she's probably just feeling nervous right now. Despite Max's smile when he said this, I could sense something else in Katie's behavior. When she made eye contact and spoke to me, it seemed like she was harboring some emotion other than just nervousness. From the albums and framed photos Max had shown me, Filled with pictures of Katie smiling happily surrounded by many friends, I couldn't believe she was shy. Although I was worried that Katie would not open up to me, I kept telling myself that giving her time was the best choice at the moment. Then something unexpected happened. As I was preparing dinner at the house for the weekend, as usual, I suddenly heard a big sound coming from upstairs. With Max in the shower, I immediately stopped what I was doing in the kitchen and rushed upstairs to check. There, I found Katie lying in the hallway, looking in pain. Katie. I wanted to run to her, but instinct told me that calling an ambulance was the priority, so I dialed 911 with shaking hands. Luckily, the ambulance arrived within minutes, and before Max could fully grasp the situation, Katie was hurriedly taken to the hospital. I urged Max to hurry to the hospital and we rushed to the emergency room. I waited for Katie to emerge from the treatment room, shaking with worry and anxiety. Before I knew it, it was deep into the night, and darkness enveloped everything outside. Even after the nurse led us to the doctor for an explanation, I was too distracted to fully comprehend his words. All I understood was that Katie had a genetic condition that required transplant surgery and that our medical tests as parents were needed first. The next morning, the doctor contacted us directly, and I received the good news that my organ was a likely match for Katie. At that moment, I knew without a doubt that I would undergo the transplant surgery if needed. Faced with the reality of the surgery, I was filled with fear and deep anxiety about whether I could truly save my daughter. When I shared my feelings with Max, he also looked worried but said firmly, If there's even a slight chance of saving Katie, I want you to do the surgery, even though it's a huge burden on you. I wish I could do something, or even take your place, 
but since you're the only one who can save her, I hope you can find the courage to do it. His words were like a struggle to hold back tears, a plea for strength. Encouraged by his words, I made my decision. I immediately contacted the hospital to schedule the surgery. It was about a month after our two surgeries, during the follow-up period, that I was finally able to see Katie again. Fortunately, Katie's body accepted my donated organ and her recovery was faster than expected. However, I suffered from severe anemia for some time after the surgery and needed a wheelchair to get around the hospital. When my husband visited me after work. You still look pale. Has it been like this for a while? He asked with concern. At that time, I hadn't received any specific good news from the doctors, and I was honestly filled with anxiety. But not wanting to worry my husband and Katie, who were looking forward to my discharge, I answered with conviction. Don't worry, it's nothing to worry about. Days went by when the side effects of the medication made conversation difficult and I felt unwell from morning to night. Still, the long hospital stay made my desire to return to daily life and my family and work responsibilities stronger and stronger, dominating my desire to be discharged as soon as possible. A few days after Katie was safely discharged, I finally received permission from the doctor to go home and began to prepare. Not wanting to inconvenience my husband, I decided to take a taxi home. Fortunately, my husband had completed all the remaining moving tasks while I was in the hospital, and everything was ready for our new life to begin. I had been looking forward to seeing Katie again and imagining the look on her face. At the same time, I hoped that this event would bring us closer emotionally. I looked forward to the day when I could help around the house again, fantasizing about what I could cook to make my husband and Katie happy until I found myself in front of our house. After thanking the driver, I walked through the gate, my steps still unsteady. As soon as I stepped inside, I intuitively felt that something was wrong. Unread newspapers were piled in the entryway, along with scattered letters, junk mail, and bills. Shoes were scattered haphazardly on the floor instead of being stored in the shoe closet, and an upside-down doormat was left in place, clearly indicating an abnormal daily scene. Seeing the disorder at the entrance, I was momentarily speechless with surprise. However, I tried to understand and thought that maybe my husband had been too busy with work to clean up. This hope was completely dashed as soon as I entered the living room. Food scraps were strewn across the floor and the trash can was overflowing with empty beer cans. Stains that looked like spilled liquids were dried and sticky on the floor and the entire room was filled with an unpleasant smell. Even though I do not claim to be a neat freak, the excessive mess was giving me a headache. Oh, you're back already? I turned around at his voice to see my husband sitting on a sofa covered with a dirty blanket his sweat-stained, wrinkled t-shirt sticking out. What the hell happened here? What about your work? And where's Katie? I asked, trying to get a handle on the situation. Huh? I was worried about you, so I skipped work to wait here. I can't believe I got an ungrateful sermon from you as soon as you got back. Obviously, he was drunk and his words were cold towards me. I felt the urge to argue that if he was worried, he could have at least come to pick me up, but seeing his sullen face, I swallowed my words to avoid further trouble. I'm not blaming you. I just want to know what happened here. I gently asked for an explanation of the situation. This mess is because you've been in the hospital for so long. And as for Katie, I'm really angry because despite my visits, She's been indifferent. Isn't she locked up in her room right now? He was furious. I was shocked to hear such words from Max, who had never spoken ill of Katie before. If you're well enough to come home on your own, shouldn't you have come home to your family sooner? What a heartless woman! He said sarcastically, 
clucking his tongue. Then he suddenly pressed some papers on me. Stunned by the sudden action, I took the paper and realized it was the divorce papers. What is this? What does it mean? I asked, confused. I feel bad for you rushing home despite being sick, but my decision is firm. You neglect the house, make me pay all the hospital expenses, and then blame me for the mess. The mess in this house is your fault. A wife who neglects her housework because of anemia or whatever is just a nuisance. It seems Katie hasn't warmed up to you either, so it's best for both of us to part ways now. He said coldly. Facing my husband's anger, I could see that the calm and composed atmosphere had vanished. I don't intend to blame or lecture you. I know it wasn't good to leave the house for so long. But my anemia has greatly improved, and I can now do household chores without any problems. Let's enjoy this opportunity to be together as a family. Despite my words, he seemed unwilling to listen. You are in a difficult financial situation and you are just after my assets. You took a taxi home today so that I would think of you as a kind wife who cares for her husband and I wouldn't leave you, right? His accusations were unbelievable and I repeatedly tried to explain and clear up the misunderstanding. But it seemed he wanted to label me as a wife who couldn't handle work or household chores properly due to losing an organ. He claimed that he had no choice but to consider divorce because of my condition and even mentioned asking for property division. I was simply stunned and at a loss for words. To be treated as a nuisance after being a donor for his daughter was unimaginable. Confronted with my husband's ruthlessness, I felt the love in my heart gradually disappear. Although I didn't regret the organ transplant, Katie became like a real daughter to me, and I was truly relieved that we were compatible as a donor and a recipient. Saving a young life full of potential gave me real joy. However, I was no longer able to help an unfaithful husband. If my husband wanted a divorce, I was ready to face him and sign the divorce papers with determination. Since I had no intention of paying the property division, I informed him that I would leave the matter to my lawyer. Although I was deeply irritated by his carefree attitude, I did not want to damage my recently recovered body again for such a person. Thus, I took all my belongings from the hospital stay and quietly left the house. The lawyer's negotiations lasted for months and resulted in the dismissal of the property division claim. The assets accumulated during our marriage were subject to division, but the savings I had diligently accumulated before the marriage were returned to me. So the divorce went through smoothly, and I thought there would be no further involvement with my ex-husband. A year after the divorce, I was as committed to my work as ever. The company I worked for was one of the largest in the area, and a departmental transfer almost eliminated any chance of running into my ex-husband. Although my body was smaller due to the organ transplant, regular checkups showed no abnormalities and I maintained my health. I was reassured that Katie was doing well because I hadn't heard from the hospital. My colleagues, understanding and considerate, avoided the subject of my ex-husband and helped me try to forget him. One weekend, while relaxing in my newly rented apartment, Max unexpectedly visited. Not recognizing him on the intercom screen at first because of the poor image quality, I accidentally opened the door. My ex-husband appeared even more disheveled than when I left, with no trace of the star salesman he once was. Seeing him made my skin crawl with discomfort, but since it was daytime and there were people around, I kept my voice low and responded calmly. What are you doing here? We agreed a year ago that we would never see each other again. I've been properly informed about Katie from the hospital, so I don't need you. I replied coldly. I got your address from someone in your department. How's your health? I heard that you went back to work a while ago and I was worried about you. You know, I was too harsh because of my workload. I did it for your sake. 
Please understand that. I think we can have a much better relationship now. Why don't we give it another try? He spoke with a completely different attitude, as if the past incidents had never happened. Despite my clear refusal, he didn't seem to get the message at all. This situation only added to my discomfort. Even as I stood there, pale with shock and anger, Max continued to talk as if nothing was wrong. Finally, he tried to force open the door, which was slightly ajar, and I resisted with all my might to close it. At my resistance, my ex-husband suddenly became angry and began to utter terrible words that no one would want to hear. Unable to stand it any longer, I managed to close and lock the door and quickly returned to the room to call the police. After explaining the situation, the police arrived promptly, and he was taken away. Since then, his behavior became even more erratic and he began to show up daily at my workplace without any business. He followed me to public places such as the bathroom and the staff cafeteria, hurled unpleasant insults, and influenced the people around me. He even approached the new employees I was mentoring, attempting to tarnish my reputation. Despite a warning from the HR manager, Max improved only temporarily, and I began to feel severe stress from his actions. Driven by a strong refusal to let him interfere with my important work, I decided to file a claim for damages. Subsequently, his actions were found to be highly inappropriate and my claims were fully accepted. In the midst of these events, I received a heartfelt apology from the man who had given my address to him. He was a direct subordinate of Max, and we had worked together in the sales department before, and he was unable to refuse his request. He offered information about Max's current situation. After our divorce, Katie left a note saying, I'm going back to my mother, and left his house. When Max returned from a week-long business trip, Katie's room was already empty. Contacting his ex-wife revealed a shocking truth. It turned out that Katie was not related to Max by blood. There was no history of the disease in my ex-husband's family, nor in his ex-wife's lineage, leading to the conclusion that Katie's biological father was the ex-wife's current husband. It was revealed that there had been serious problems between Max and his ex-wife for over a decade before Katie's birth. While it's likely that the ex-wife's infidelity was the cause of their divorce, it's also possible that Max raised Katie simply to gain sympathy from others. The situation escalated when the ex-wife discovered multiple bruises on Katie's body after taking her home. According to Katie, these injuries were caused by Max. With this information, the ex-wife successfully regained custody through legal action. This development added stress to Max, who began bringing alcohol into the company and wasting money on gambling. As a result, child support payments from his ex-wife stopped and he was fired from the company. With the addition of property division payments to me, he fell into debt. His current whereabouts and activities are unknown. This series of events caused me to consider a change in employment. Being ostracized and viewed with curiosity by others, despite my innocence, affected the quality of my work. Knowing that my ex-husband had my address, I decided to move out of state and start a new life. Occasionally, I received letters from Katie and her mother. Every time I read about Katie's well-being and the gratitude from her mother, I feel confident and proud of my actions in saving a life.